and welcome again to my videos for Physical Chemistry 2. In the past two videos, we've been looking at some of the fundamental ideas of quantum mechanics. We've seen that one of the fundamental concepts is that objects that we usually consider to be particles actually have wave-like nature. Because of this, there are five basic postulates of quantum mechanics that underlie all the most important ideas of the field. We've already talked about three of those postulates. The first one states that all matter can be described using wave equations called wave functions, and the wave function of a system provides a complete description of the system so that all the properties and behaviors of the system can be determined if we know the wave function. The second postulate tells us that every measurable property of a system can be represented by a mathematical operator. And the third postulate says that when we perform a measurement on a system, we're causing the operator to act on the wave function of the system. And the wave function and numerical result of the measurement are the eigenfunction and eigenvalue of an eigenvalue equation. As we saw in video 3, the fact that systems behave like waves means that their properties usually don't have a precisely defined value. For example, it's not correct to say that a system has a precise position. Instead, we can only say that the system has a certain probability of being in a particular region of space. For example, if we're looking at an electron, it might have a 95% probability of being in this region. Since there's a distribution of values that a particular property can have, rather than a single value, we usually want to know the mean, or average, value of the property. The next postulate of quantum mechanics tells us how to use the wave function to determine the mean value of a property. But before we can determine that, we need to think a little more deeply about the mathematics of probability. Suppose we're playing a game with a deck of cards, and each card belongs to one of four groups, which we'll indicate with the variable j. The first group is the face cards, that is, the jacks, queens, and kings. The second group is the number cards from 2 to 10. The third group is the aces, and the fourth group is the jokers. What's the probability that the card we draw is from each of these groups? This is the kind of calculation that you're so familiar with that you probably don't think too much about exactly what steps the calculation consists of. But they'll be important for us when we talk about how to calculate probabilities with wave functions, so let's think through the details. First, let's think about group 1. There are 12 face cards in a deck, and the deck contains 54 cards. Remember, this deck includes two jokers, so the deck has 54 cards and not 52. To determine the probability, we divide the number of face cards by the total number of cards. So, that's 12 divided by 54, which is 0 0.222. We follow a similar procedure for the other three groups. There are 36 cards with a value between 2 and 10, so the probability of drawing one is 36 divided by 54, which is 0 0.667. Next, there are four aces, so the probability of getting an ace is 4 over 54 or 0 0.074. And the probability of getting a joker is 2 over 54, or 0 0.036. Now let's think about what we actually did there. If we were to express the procedure for determining a probability using an equation, we could write it this way. Here, pj is the probability that the outcome will belong to group j nj is the number of possible outcomes that belong to group J, and plain n is the total number of possible outcomes. If you look at the probabilities we calculated, one thing you'll notice is that the sum of the probabilities is 1. We can write that this way. In this equation, we're taking the sum of the probabilities that will get a result in the groups from 1 to small n, which is the number of groups. It makes sense that the probabilities add up to 1, because the card we draw must belong to one of the four groups we defined. As you might recall from video 3, when the sum of the probabilities in a distribution is 1, we say that the distribution is normalized. Now let's look at a more complex question. 
Suppose that the cards in each group have different values, which will symbolize by the letter X. For example, suppose a face card is worth 10 points, the cards between 2 and 10 are worth 5 points, aces are worth 15, and the jokers are worth 50. If we choose a card at random, what will be its average value? This is another kind of problem you've probably solved before, but you may not have thought too much about the mathematics. There's a different probability of getting a card with each of the possible values, so to determine the average value, we need to take a weighted average of the value of each card. In this case, there's a 0.222 probability that we'll get a result with a value of 10, a 0.667 probability that our result will have a value of 5, a 0.074 that it'll have a value of 15, and a 0.036 probability that it'll have a value of 50. By multiplying each value by its probability, we weight the values so that more probable ones count more than less probable ones. Now, if we add each weighted value together, we get the average value of a randomly selected card, which turns out to be 8.465. So, what did we do here? We multiplied each value by its probability and took the sum of these over all the groups. The result of this calculation is the average value of x. We symbolize that this way, using angle brackets. This is also called the expectation value of x, and that's the term we'll use in this class, instead of calling it an average. So, whenever we want to know an average value of any quantity, we do it by using a similar equation. For example, if we want to calculate the expectation value of x squared, we do it using this equation. If we try that for the data set we've been working with, here's what we'll get. For each of the four groups, we multiplied the square of x by the probability of drawing a card from that group. When we perform this calculation, we get 145.525, so that's the expectation value of x squared. There's one other calculation related to probabilities that we'll want to know about. The variance of a quantity is related to the standard deviation, and it's indicated with the symbol lowercase sigma squared. It gives us a sense of how wide the distribution of the values is. The smaller the variance, the narrower the distribution. The variance of x is equal to the expectation value of x squared minus the square of the expectation value of x. Let's calculate the variance for the data set we've been looking at. We already calculated the expectation value of x squared, which is 145.525. From that, we subtract the square of 8.465, the expectation value of x. That gives us a variance of 73.869. So, what does this have to do with quantum mechanics? Well, as we saw earlier, most properties of a system will follow a distribution rather than having only a single possible value. That means we can use the concepts we just discussed to calculate the average value of a property, that is, its expectation value. But there's one complication. All the examples of expectation values we've looked at so far were calculated for quantities that could only have specific values. For example, the playing cards we discussed could only have values of 5, 10, 15, or 50. We say that such properties can have only discrete values. But there are many properties of a physical system that are not limited in this way. For example, the position or momentum of a system can have any value, so it's not possible to write a summation like this for the expectation value, since there are an infinite number of different values that x could have. Properties like this are said to be continuous. So instead, we need to use calculus. We'll use integrals in our equations instead of summations. For example, here are the three equations we saw when working with the expectation values a few minutes ago. If we want to calculate the expectation value of a continuous property like the position, we'll change the summations to integrals, which gives us these. Notice the main differences between the two sets of equations. 
First, because we're no longer taking a summation, we don't need a subscript on the probability or on the property we're finding the expectation value of. Finally, notice that the limits of the integral are negative and positive infinity. That's because the system we're studying is always described by a wave function, and a wave function is spread throughout all of space. This brings us to the fourth of the postulates of quantum mechanics. You might recall from video four that we can represent the act of taking a measurement on a system using this equation, where the eigenvalue a is the numerical value of our measurement. It'll often be the case that we want to predict the average value of a property we're measuring. In other words, we want to calculate the expectation value of A. The fourth postulate tells us that the expectation value of A is given by this fraction. This probably looks a little unfamiliar, but let's think about what it's actually telling us. You might recall from video three that this integral is equal to one if the wave function is normalized. We saw in video three that wave functions that describe realistic systems should be normalized, so the denominator is usually going to be equal to one, and we can omit it from this fraction. In the numerator, we have the operator for the property we're measuring, and it's acting on the wave function. The result of that operation is multiplied by the complex conjugate of the wave function, and then the integral is calculated. Notice that the variable of the integral is given as d tau. The simple tau is a generic symbol we use to indicate the spatial dimensions involved with the calculation. In other words, if we're just calculating the position along the x-axis, then tau would just be x. On the other hand, if we were calculating the position in three dimensions, then d tau would mean dx, dy, dz, and this would actually be a triple integral. One thing that's important to remember is that this equation gives us the expectation value of the property we're studying. In other words, it represents the average we'd get over the course of many measurements. However, each individual measurement will probably not give us that exact result. Instead, the individual measurements each give us a result represented by the eigenvalue a in this equation. One of the most important eigenvalue equations we'll work with is this one. You might recall from the previous video that h hat is called the Hamiltonian operator, and it's the operator we use to determine the total energy of a system. For that reason, the eigenvalue on the right side is e, the total energy. If we write out the Hamiltonian, here's what the equation looks like. The energy of a system is something we often want to know, so this is an especially useful equation. It was developed in 1928 by the Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger. Schrödinger was a really colorful character and was almost as well known for the scandals in his personal life as he was for his scientific discoveries. He was involved in several extramarital affairs, apparently with the approval of his wife, Anne-Marie. In fact, he developed this equation while he was staying at a resort to recover from tuberculosis in the company of one of his mistresses. This is now known as the Schrodinger equation in his honor. Let's remind ourselves of what this equation is doing. The first term on the left side calculates the kinetic energy of the system, and the second term calculates the potential energy. The variables here are the space dimensions. In Cartesian coordinates, they'd be x, y, and z. However, notice that there's one variable that seems to be missing. This equation, and actually all the equations we've looked at so far, don't include time as a variable. For that reason, this equation is sometimes called the time-independent Schrodinger equation. This equation actually describes a system that's frozen in time. It's as though we had taken a snapshot of the system and were calculating the energy of the system at that instant. Of course, real systems change over time. The electrons and nuclei move, and that alters the energy from one moment to the next. And that brings us to the fifth and final postulate of quantum mechanics. This postulate says that the wave function of a system changes with time according to this equation. 
The symbol capital Psi is the time-dependent wave function, and it's equal to the time-independent one we've been using up till now, multiplied by a factor of e raised to the power negative i times the energy times t over h bar. If we measure the energy of this system using that wave function instead of the time-independent one, we get this equation. We have h hat as the operator, because that's always the operator we use to determine the total energy of a system. On the right side, we get negative i h bar times the derivative of capital Psi with respect to time. This is called the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. As you can imagine, it's important to know how chemical systems change with time. But despite this, almost all the work we do in this course will use the time-independent wave function and the time-independent Schrodinger equation. From now on, whenever I refer to the Schrodinger equation, I'll be referring to the time-independent version. And the same is true when I refer to the wave function. Well, that's enough new material for today. We've now seen all five of the basic postulates of quantum mechanics. Now that we've learned those, we're finally ready to start delving into the wave function. I told you that the wave function is a wave equation, and we've talked about some of the conditions that a valid wave function must meet, such as being single-valued and continuous. But that doesn't really give you a good sense of what the actual wave function looks like. We're now ready to start looking at that, so I hope you'll join me for that in the next video. Until then, have a good week.